You're listening to the Hunt Suburbia Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Guyette. Big bucks I've been dreaming often. Every night till I'm in a coffin. Vermont Woods to the burbs of Boston. I'm looking for a tree to get lost in. Chris Warner's little dust in the snow. Quality time, just me and my bow. Fall evenings, I know just where to go for some quality times for me and my bow. It's just me and my bow. This episode is brought to you by Heron Hill Winery. Go to heronhill.com, make sure that they deliver to your state, and use code HS5 at checkout for an additional 5%. This week, I sit back down with Kevin Polis, and we give a rut update on what we're seeing in the woods this week in Massachusetts. We're both headed up to Vermont for the rifle opener this weekend, and uh, expect some of the same activity up there, but um, we also talk about the nice eight-point buck that he harvested to fill his first buck tag this year, um, and a buck that he shot at and didn't recover the week before, which is just part of bow hunting and um, something that we all have to deal with. So we get into that and following blood trails and um, a little bit about when to get on the track, when to let the blood sit for a little while. And uh, I think it's some really good information for everybody. So we hope you enjoy it. Okay, we're live for another episode of Hunt Suburbia. Got Kevin Polis back. We just went to the uh, the rifle range. Thanks for bringing me over there. Sighting the gun for this weekend. Uh, got Vermont opener up at deer camp. So thanks uh, thanks for taking me out. It was fun. Yeah, no problem. Yep. Um, Kevin's had uh, eventful. He, he, I think you've sat how many times this year? Three, four? Oh God, well probably more than that. Not very many, and you've but not a ton. Yeah, you've already uh, had more action. I would say to say than me. So congratulations on an awesome buck. Oh, thanks. That was just a couple days ago. Now. Yep, it's last Saturday. Um, why don't we just, like, well, let's just start out with, like, the kill story and tell the story of that buck, and then we'll get into, um, we'll backtrack a little bit and get into the buck that you saw the week before. Sure. Um, so that was last Saturday. Um, the Saturday before was actually the Saturday that we had all that snow, and it was really cold, um, and I had hit a buck that, in the high in the shoulder that weekend, which we can go back and talk about that one a little bit after, but... Um, <clears throat> never recovered. This was in the same stand, um, and my number one stand. Uh, I got in in the morning. I got in pretty early. I can't remember what the temps were that morning, actually. It definitely wasn't 19 degrees, which it was the weekend before, but uh, it was cold enough. Um, got in the stand clean, didn't hear anything. I have to walk through you know, quite a bit of an area. Um, it's not that far. It's just the deer use that whole area from the minute I get out of the truck. Yeah. Um, it was a cold morning. I remember because that was, was the, that's. I think that's when I had some chasing going on. It was uh, like four. It was cool. It was like forty degrees or something. Yeah, it definitely wasn't warm like what we've been seeing these last week or two. Oh my god! Um, but got in the stand clean. My friend was hunting in there with me as well. He was at his stand, um, and I think it got light <clears throat> around a little before six, maybe we could actually you know, see something. I think legal shooting was at 10 of six. I, I believe sunrise was like seven twenty. Yep. And, um, this deer came in literally at like six Oh five. And when I heard him coming, I heard him kind of trotting, but honestly, I thought it was a coyote. And, yeah. You said that. Yeah. And I was about to switch my arrow to one of my crappy arrows that I'll use a use. I don't want to um, and, and you I got waste, a coyote arrow. Yeah, well, I had not so much the arrow, but the broadhead. I had I had wait, lost that broadhead from um, using those new severed broadheads, and um, I had lost one the week before. So I had one on my good arrow, and then I had a couple rages, and so I really didn't want to waste that last severed. I had already ordered a couple new ones that were coming, but I only had that one. I really didn't want to waste that on a coyote. So, and sometimes I run into that situation where I might have like a crap arrow to shoot at something, um, like a coyote or something like that. Uh, and, uh, I was all ready to switch, switch <laughs> over to it real quick. And, uh, I looked over and at about 30, 40 yards, I could see, uh, a deer coming and I was like, Whoa, it's a deer. So I had my camera set up. And so 
for the first time ever in this tree stand, I moved the camera arm onto my left side onto a tree that's to the left of me. And so when I have my bow in my hand, it's you know it's going to be tough to to grab it quickly. But I did that because most of the time the deer come on my right my, on my left side, so it's hard to swing the camera over from my right. And the wind was blowing directly down where this deer was coming from. So I wasn't expecting anything really to come in close there. Yeah. So I had it set on the other side. Well, sure enough, it, it, because things happen so fast, um, I wasn't able to even get the camera on. If it was on my right side, I would have had that camera ready and <laughs> I would have got great goes. footage. Yeah, typical. So I grabbed the bow as soon as I saw it was a deer and I was going to grab the camera and I saw an ant- I saw antlers and he was coming quick. I said, I don't have time to do anything with the camera. <clears throat> and so we came in. And he slowed down for a second, and um, I had some scent out. I had just put out a mock scrape um, from Chad there. I'm not sure if you've touched base with Chad. No, I still haven't. I need to. uh, From Backyard Scents. Um, He's a Massachusetts guy, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah. And I just reached out to him this year. A friend of mine uh, got in touch with him, was using some of his scents, and um, you know, he's a local guy. He loves to support local guys, and he has um, these... Uh, scent products that he uses and he gets from the glands not so much urine uh, but the glands and um so i got some of his product and and when i came into my stand i had made a scrape right there um probably 20 yards from my stand 18 yards and i put some of the buck scrape gland and then some of the 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 uh, the licking branch spray that he has and um so i did that and when the deer came in he came in he was coming in broadside and he was about maybe five yards or 10 feet maybe from that scrape, and he stopped. Um, and I don't know if he stopped because he was getting my wind. I don't know if he smelled the scrape. I'm, I'm going to think, uh, I'm going to guess that originally it was the scrape because it probably was right there, and he probably yep. hit his nose. And so instead of cruising right through, he stopped. <clears throat> and, of course, now I'm at full draw. And when he stopped, of course, just like the deer did the week before, he had a, a small tree right on his vitals. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh boy. I said, I could possibly squeeze this in around and hit him a little back, <clears throat> or I can just wait. And then I knew my wind was blowing right at him, and he started looking back towards in my direction. Not up at me, but in my direction. Again, I don't know if he was winding me or if he was smelling that scrape. I don't know what he was smelling. It's funny. Like, so many of the deer that I've seen this year have come right from where my wind has been blowing. And I haven't had n- nothing really. The only time I had any any deer spook was the other day when my phone fell off my <laughs> little camera thing and spooked those does. But I, I think, I don't know. I haven't been taking super extra precaution with my scent control, but maybe I'm just up high enough. Yeah. You know, I always think that, too. Like, especially that day. Um you don't know. I, You know, especially with the mature bucks, you know, I've shot, I don't know how many that have come downwind. Yeah. Quite a few, actually. they got to be smelling you. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I think if you, like you said, if you have send out sometimes, and I'm not a huge believer on it, but I definitely think your send control just buys you time. I think a lot of other yeah. guys say the same thing. You yeah. know, it, it helps. How much it helps, it depends, you know, how much you stink. <laughs> and I think it depends on if the deer are in an area where they do smell humans all the time sure. and they're kind of habituated to it, right? Sure. And if you, I think if you definitely have some scent control on, uh, it, it, it gives that buck time to think, is that person 50 yards from me? Are they 300 yards from me? Like, yeah. it, it gives them enough time. And then if you have other doe scent out, you know, if they're in the mood... You know, that kind of over- oversees everything. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And they're just like, ah, he's 300 yards away. I'm going to take a chance. But I don't know what this deer was doing. I'm not sure what he's winning. I, I was getting ready to be busted. Yep. That's just my mentality. You know, I actually completely forgot about the scrape that I had made at the time. So I completely forgot that he was right next to it. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, oh, 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 he's, I'm busted. He's were, you, were you at draw at that oh, point? Oh, yeah, I was a yeah. full draw. Full draw before he even walked into the clearing. Talk about your draw for a second. Um, do you wait for them to be behind a tree, or it doesn't? It just depends on where the deer's coming from? or You know, because I've, I've drawn back while they're right in, you know, right in the open with their head up, and they could potentially see me. I mean, if, that, if you have to. But obviously try to wait to draw back if they're going behind some tree or some brush or something so that, right? But Yeah, I mean. I, what'd you do here? I mean, I think that's probably the most, one of the, I think drawing on a deer, especially any deer really, but even a mature deer is like one of the biggest things you learn, like 
from a beginner and on. Like it's, you yeah. know, you learn a ton of things deer hunting every day. We learn something, but I think that's, and I've been talking to a couple of friends of mine that, um, you know, that are kind of new into deer hunting and don't have a lot of experience and saying that's like, you need some of that experience. You got to get some deer in and practice drawing because that is like the toughest thing. And, and it's crucial, right? It's, it's, it's crucial. Like it's everything. I think, you know, it's, that's what's, se- it's a big thing that separates, you know, like there's always that argument between compounds and crossbows. Right. Compound. I mean, that's, I think the toughest part sometimes is getting drawn that's back. When they bust you. Yeah. I mean, it's the movement, the sound, whatever, whatever, you know, maybe, um, and so in this particular situation and many, you know, probably many of the deer I've had to shoot, at least some of the mature bucks, it's happening super quick. As soon as I know, you know, they're coming in, they're on a, they're, you know, they're on a mission seeking or whatever it is or chasing a doe. And you're just, as soon as you, you they're in close, you're drawing, you know, um, you know, the times where they're, if you're in a thick area, like the area I'm in, I have a lot of shot, op- shot opportunities, uh, where I first saw him was kind of thick and I couldn't shoot him, but with an, I knew he was moving quick and that the way he was going and I didn't think he was going to stop, I, as soon as I saw the antlers, he was probably 35 yards away and I knew which way he was angling um, that, okay, boom, I drew back instantly, was ready to stop him, grunt stop him and shoot him in about 30 yards, but instead he kind of angled a little bit closer to me. Yeah. And again, I think it was the scent. And at the time I completely forgot about the scent. <laughs> so... He angled towards me like 20 yards, and I was shocked. I'm like, oh, he's coming in closer, and that's when he slowed down. And So I'm at full draw. I don't know how long it was. I don't. It probably wasn't that long. It felt like a long time, as it always does. But, um, you know, I, he started looking back to my direction, and he still was behind that tree. But what ended up happening was when he was looking back at me, he actually at one point moved his body away from that tree a little bit, <clears throat> and it opened up his vitals. I'd say the tree was still on part of his leg and his, you know, into his neck and stuff, but he was, he moved back on like, oh my God, I have a shot and I'm already at full draw. If I hadn't drawn back yeah. already, there's no way in a million years I would have drawn back. That deer would not have taken off. Because he, he was looking at you? Looking, not at me, but in my direction, whether it's... Enough where you would have been picked off. Absolutely. hundred yeah. percent. He was only 20 yards. Um, he, absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind that he was kind of on alert. Not, not really, but... Um, he knew something was, was going on, whether it was, yep. the, whether it was the buck's scent or my scent. But, uh, so I was already at full draw and, um, I knew, okay, I'm thinking in my head, uh, oh, he's about to bolt. He's about to bolt. Boom. The window opened up. I put the pin on him, um, and shot. And I, I shot back a little bit thinking that, um, yeah, I think just subconsciously you're trying to stay away from the tree, trying to stray from the tree. So yeah. I think I just kind of aimed back a little bit. So I hit him back a little bit. It wasn't bad. It was kind of in the middle of the body a little bit, and it was a little high, but out of the tree stand, um, you know, that's fine with the angle getting down, hit the lungs. So when I hit him, he took off. He flew across this, like, kind of little draw that we call the bowl, and he cut over to the left, and at that point, I saw, I watched where he last, I could see him, and it was between a kind of a, a bunch of boulders on a hill and then a blowdown. And he went, he, he struggled a little on the side of the hill. I saw when he got about 60, 50 yards away. I saw him struggle a little bit, but then he kept going. And then he quickly, swiftly kind of walked, uh, trod a little bit to the left. And there's blowdowns right there. And again, this is only about 80 yards from me, maybe. And he disappeared, didn't come out the other side, and I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear him crash, and it was real quiet. I didn't hear him walk away. I didn't hear him, like, breaking nothing. It was complete silent yeah and i'm listening and listening and listening up something okay he must have stopped there and he's walking towards the pines where they bed where they bed a lot and uh i just assumed that he was walking and that's why i couldn't hear anything so i waited so now of course like you pretty much almost always do at least i do you're second guessing the shot <laughs> <laughs> and i had just shouldered that one the week before which was the first time i'd ever done that um and so uh I'm waiting and waiting and, and five, I think 10 minutes go by and I look up and here comes the coyote and it's on the other side of that ravine. And I'm like, Oh my God, it's going to meet up with that blood trail. If there is one over there where he walked. You think he he knows, he knows, um, the sound of, you know, you shooting an arrow by this point or somebody in that area shooting an arrow and he comes to investigate 
and ah, see if there's been. Uh... I don't. I mean, there are a lot of coyotes in here, <clears> and um, I've shot a few in there, and I've seen a ton. Um, Cause you know, up in Anacostia, where I told you that I, we we go hunting every once in a while, my dad, and my uncle, the foxes up there. There's only deer and foxes. There's some grouse and stuff, but in terms of like mammals, it's like deer and foxes. There's moose every once in a while. Foxes are the only predators on the island, and they 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 can't kill a deer. But when you shoot up there, you shoot at a deer. The, you, the foxes come out of the hills because they they're accustomed to <laughs> they're accustomed to hearing gunshots and they know that means gut pile and yeah, then I was they, say, they feast on the gut pile. They're at least getting the gut pile. So it's crazy when you shoot, you'll see them just wow. come up the trail. They'll, they'll be running running up the the street right at you. So I think maybe coyotes will do that. I mean, I definitely it's possible he heard him running. I think he just happened to be in the area and smelt him. Yeah, that would be my guess. I I'm, I'm yeah. not sure. It could be total coincidence. Yeah. Totally. I'd never been in that situation before where within minutes there was a coyote. Um, you know, it wasn't a situation where he was tracking the buck. He did not come from where the buck was. He didn't cross that. He didn't cross the blood trail until he literally was 10 yards from him, which I didn't know at the time. I did yeah. not know. In the end, I ended up realizing this buck dropped right where I last saw him behind the bushes, and yep. I didn't know that. Right where he was struggling there. Well, just a little yeah. bit past it, yeah. yeah. He probably went another 20 yards and when I last saw him behind the, the, these trees, um, is, That's all right. is the um, last time that last time I saw him is where he dropped, and yep. and so the coyote just happened to be coming across that that draw on that ridge, and um, just I think maybe he heard him. I don't know. Again, he didn't crash. There was nothing to draw attention other than yeah, me shooting. Yeah, I was just thinking maybe you know <laughs> it's possible. I don't evolving know evolving herd thing that we we're talking about with deer. I'm sure. The coyotes, the coyotes are getting, thing. they're evolving, they're yeah. getting smarter. I mean, listen, he was definitely close by. <laughs> yeah. You know, and he wasn't running. He was just kind of coming that trot. I actually, as soon as I saw him, I started squealing at him, doing a rabbit, wounded rabbit, which this is the first time that it never worked. Well, yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe <clears throat> it hasn't worked before, but a lot of times it works for me. Uh, and I've shot a few deer with the bow, a uh, ki- few coyotes with the bow doing that. You put your shitty arrow back in there and... Yeah. <laughs> at this well, at this point, I don't even know if I had an arrow in because I just yeah. shot. Oh yeah, I probably did. I probably reloaded. But um, he, when he came in, I'm just like, oh my god, he's gonna. I'm not again, not realizing that the buck is right there, dead. I'm thinking yep. he's gonna get on the blood trail and go after my deer and maybe push it up if I yeah. push it up out of it. So did bed. you get down early because of that? No. Like, or so, did you? How long did you wait before you got down? And so the people know, you know. What what's the custom? Wait a half hour if you think it's a good shot. Wait okay, longer so, if it was a bad shot. So if you take the coyote out of the equation, because that really had my mind going. I'm texting everybody, and everybody's telling me something different. I'm like, I don't know what to do here yeah. because my fear was that I didn't make a great shot um, as far as like didn't get both lungs, and that the deer did walk away, and maybe he's another 150 yards away. And that he's bedded down and going to die wherever he is. And then now that coyote is going to come along and push him right out of that bed. And yep. Is he going to get? Is he going to clot up in his bed and then get up, get away from the coyote? And now I'm not going to find him. You know. So if you take the co- the coyote out of the equation, you know what I did in that situation. I never get right down and look at my arrow. I can tell you that. Even though I knew, even if knowing where he was dead, if if even though I didn't know he was dead there, if he was bedded there, I still could have snuck down and checked. But I never do that. Yeah. Calm down. I text people. (laughs) You know, I'm like, this shot deer, relax. Um, If I had it on film, which I didn't, this this would have helped me a lot if I did film this because it was so close. It would have been good footage. But I'll check the film, look at the footage. But in this case, just calm down, talk to a couple people on the phone. I waited probably... um, I wait. So I probably waited too long. I waited at least 45 minutes to an hour, I think, before I even got out of my stand. That's good, though. It was a morning kill, right? So Yeah, and it got, was early. You've got all day, as long right. as it wasn't going to get super hot. I don't think right. it was that day. It was going to get in the 50s. But Yeah. And, 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 you know, again, my only concern in this situation was the coyote. So even if I knew I made a, an awesome shot, you know, and still didn't see him go down, I'll be honest with you. Even when I've seen them go down, I still take my time. Like, yeah. I kind of well, another deer could be moment. coming through too, right? It, of course. Who knows? I mean, and and you know, it, absolutely, especially in the middle of the rut. Um, you know, a perfect example is that the the buck last year that I shot. Uh, not last year, two years ago, I called in, rattled in that ten pointer, and shot him. Watched him fall. Yeah. And then as I'm on the phone or texting people, a big, big, huge drop time came oh, yeah. in. Came right in because he heard my buck crash. Yep. 
had heard the rattling earlier. Well, he came in, I don't know, it was maybe five, 10, not even 10 minutes later. He was bedded up in the pines and heard the whole commotion. He came in trotting fast. I mm-hmm. stopped him. Of course, I missed him. Heartache. But yeah, yeah, another one can come come in any time. But um, I'm not really thinking that. I usually like, I really like to enjoy the moment. Mm-hmm. I like to sit in the stand. I like to just, you know, even like that temp, you know, even when you see one fall, I just really like to enjoy the moment. There's no rush. Yeah, you want to get your hands on them, but I just... Also because you're still keeping the anticipation a little bit of the of walking up to it, right? Oh, absolutely. If you saw them you're drop right. and you get there right away, then it's like you're 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 using all that adrenaline right away. A hundred percent. It's yeah. the it's the greatest feeling. It's it's just incredible, uh, when you when it comes together and it's down. I mean, if you've had enough instances where you've had to track deer and maybe found them but you had your heart was sunk or you had to wait overnight or even deer that you've lost it just when you actually see them go down or you walk up on them it's 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 so yeah. re- so rewarding but yep. um but yeah you know i waited a bit and um had everybody telling me get down not everybody but some people telling me get down get down <laughs> that coyote's on him you got to go get him yeah. oh, he's eating the he's eating the deer so i said well i got to get down and i i didn't have luminox or anything on these arrows it's a whole other story i had to I had to switch my arrows and stuff the day before but so i couldn't see my arrow i knew it was a pass through just the way it went through but I couldn't see it. So I got down, I snuck over, and I had blood through the arrow. It was a pass through. And I had a little bit of blood um, that sprayed, and there was a little bit of bubbles in it. Um, not enough to tell me that it was a double lung hit, but I know I at least got one lung mm-hmm. with showing the air and the bubbles in, in the blood. Yep. So for newbies out there, if you get bubbles in your blood, that's a lung shot, right? Yep, that's it's what a, you want. It shows that the that that blood was aerating when it was coming out and it's coming straight out of their lungs. Yep. And in this case, it was a pass through. So, you know, just another thing when you're tracking deer and if you have the deer bleeding out both sides, if you can see bubbles on both sides, that's, yeah. a, that's a good indication that you got both lungs. Yep. Um, you know, sometimes you might like, especially if it's a shot a- a- angle and you hit it kind of high, like I, I thought I hit it a lot higher than I did, but, um, you might only catch that back lung and, they can live with a one lung. They can definitely go far with it, and they can definitely live with it. So, so just, if you see if you see the the bubbly blood, what do you tell somebody to do at that point? Does that mean go, or does that mean wait a little bit longer? So, <laughs> again, me, I have a ton of patience, and I'm always unsure. I never feel good. Um, you know, I think it's because I, I elk that I shot. The bull elk that I shot that still haunts me to this this day, which is, we'll have to tell that story another day, which is yep. just an incredible. Ever since that elk, which I'm pretty sure that I hit in the lung and uh, the liver, that I pushed up out of its bed, that my friend and I pushed up. Yeah, uh, I. You wait now. I if I could, I'd wait five days probably now. I just <laughs> that stung me so bad, and I've lost a couple big bucks. Um, the few deer that I've actually lost, I think I've lost uh, three or four maybe in the last 30 years of hunting. And, and of course, they were nice bucks. And that, it just stings. I, I, I just do not want to get out. I, I would say if you see if you see bubbles, it's a great sign, but it does not hurt to wait a little bit. I was just going to say it really doesn't hurt just no. to wait, especially if it's, a, if, if it's a morning you got all day. It's not going to be tropical weather. Yeah, and there's not a pack of coyotes that you think are eating <laughs> eating your deer, right? I, I mean, exactly. Like it, it, the, the question I think a lot of the time is, do you want to leave it overnight? And mm-hmm. you know, that deer that I shot the week before in the snow storm there, um, when I hit him in the shoulder, I knew right away. I'd never hit one high in the shoulder. I don't know how, but in all these years of hunting, I've never hit one high in the shoulder. Well, I have now. And I hit him high in the shoulder, and as soon as I hit him, I was like, oh, that deer is gonna live. You know, it didn't, it wasn't a ton of penetration and I just instantly was like, this deer is going to live. So luckily for the snow, when I tracked him, I waited about an hour at least, maybe more, maybe an hour and a half. I got down and I found trickly blood maybe 50 yards after the shot and I, it looked dark red. So I'm thinking, okay, I know it's not a liver shot because of where I hit him and usually dark red, you know, is, is one indication of a liver shot. Um, so I tracked him um, about 30 yards of, of, of blood, kind of spraying, but, you know, it was not, not great. Uh, a lot of it was drop, drop, drop. It was drop. One, one side, right? One side, drop here, drop there. <laughs> Again, if it wasn't for the snow, I probably never would have yeah. tracked him. And 
I tracked him as he was going into a thicket. So it was probably a hundred and I don't even know it was over a hundred yards from my stand, but it was into a thicket. And I did not, I knew where it hit. And um, my, my thinking is that he's going to live. If he's going to die, I, that means I got a, um, some kind of artery up there, you know, and he'll bleed out that way. But my thinking is he's not dead yet. Um, he could be, but I just didn't feel that way. So I backed out and I went back to my stand and I sat for another two hours, I think, at least. I gave him, I gave him three hours or something like that. I can't remember, three and a half hours maybe. Yeah. And then I got back down on the trail and I tracked it through the thicket. And on the other side of the thicket, he bedded twice and there was actually some good blood. And I thought, oh, he's, he's dead here somewhere right here because a lot of times they'll just keep bedding down. When mm-hmm. they're gonna die, they mm-hmm. just you know they're uncomfortable and they're on their way out. And he betted twice. There wasn't a ton of blood, but it was the most I'd seen. And then he got up from there and he had just walked straight away. And long story short, it took me it took me forty five minutes probably to find how he got out. He circled like he when he did his bed, he did a circle in like about a fifteen yard radius, maybe twenty yard radius. And and I couldn't tell which way he went because he backtracked over his blood trail. And, it's, and, and there was so many deer tracks in there that I could not, even just from that first morning of snow, I couldn't tell where he went. So it took me 45 minutes to find a drop of blood to see where he walked out of that circle. And I found it and I said, okay. And I tracked that for quite a ways. And I, you know, it's been over five hours or six hours. <clears throat> and it was just spec, spec, spec. And I found out where he bedded again. And I don't know if I had jumped him out of that bed or not. It was up on a hillside. So there was a little bit of more blood there, not much, but, um, you know, I kept tracking that after that bed, I never found another speck and I could not get on his track. And I still looked for a long time, but I just, I couldn't get him. Um, and I just was pretty confident that he lived. Um, but as far as tracking goes, you know, you just got to learn about the blood. I should, you know, tracking after you've hit one, you got to learn about the blood and, um, try and associate it with, with where you shot. Because, like, in my case, if, if you didn't tell me, if I couldn't see where I'd hit him, I would have said, oh, I hit him in the liver. Yeah. It's dark red blood. i probably hit him back, which happens a lot. Um, but in this case, I you know, I knew that I'd, I'd hit him in the shoulder. So I said, it's probably just a muscle hit. Look, I hate ticks. You hate ticks. I know you hate ticks. I know your parents hate ticks. I know your kids hate ticks. We all hate ticks. You know what I want to do to ticks? I want to kill them. You know how you do that? Sawyer permethrin. Not only repels ticks, keeps them off your clothes, but if they do happen to get on there, it'll kill them. They only have to go over an inch and a half of your clothing that's been treated with soy or permethrin to die. What's better than that? Maybe killing a big buck, but this is a close second. These guys are an amazing company. They're U.S. based. They're family owned and operated. Look for the yellow bottle. You can find them in Cabela's, Bass Pro Shop, Dick Sporting Goods, Moose Jaw, REI. Find them online. Whatever you got to do. Get Sawyer Permethrin. It is not expensive. It'll save your life from these diseases that ticks carry. And it's a quick application. You spray it on your clothes, spray it on your hat, put it on your socks and shoes, put it on your backpack, let it dry outside in the breeze, and it dries odorless. The deer are not going to pick you off from putting this stuff on your clothes. I guarantee you, get Sawyer Permethrin. You won't regret it. All right, here's a little pro tip for you guys, and this is probably the most important tip that I can give you as a hunter. Whether you're a new hunter or you're a veteran hunter, this is something that is going to go a long, long way into helping you kill deer. So make sure you're paying attention, okay? What you have to do is make sure that your wives and your girlfriends are happy during hunting season. (laughs) I mean, you, you should make sure that they're happy all year long, but especially during hunting season, make sure that they're happy. So butter them up a little bit extra. What I've always found that works really well is buying her some wine. So I buy a case of wine from Heron Hill Winery at the beginning of the season, and if I get through it, which we usually do somewhere around you know, middle November, I'll re-up and I'll buy another case. Heron Hill Winery is out of the Finger Lakes in New York. One of my best friends is the vineyard manager there. So that's why I started supporting them, but I keep coming back because I love their wine. The owner of the vineyard is a, is a big time hunter, and he makes uh, some great red wines specifically that pair well with venison and game birds. My favorite is the Eclipse Red, 
It's a nice full body red and it goes great with any kind of venison. And their game bird red is great with any kind of game birds. But I mean, they've got tons of wines. Go check them out. And they have a special deal for Hunt Suburbia podcast listeners. That's you guys. If you want to keep supporting us, please support our sponsors. And there is not a better sponsor to go out and support than Heron Hill Winery. Go to heronhill.com and use code HS5 for an additional 5%. So what they got on there is if you buy six bottles or more, there's a volume discount where you get 10% off. So with HS5, you'll get an additional 5% off, which they don't give to anybody else, just you guys. And if you buy a full case, which is 12 bottles for all of you mathematicians out there, you'll get 15% off um, from their volume discount plus an additional 5%. So that's 20% off total using code HS5. And also... Any purchases of six or more bottles, um, it's free shipping. So they're one of the only wineries that have free shipping uh, out there, and they'll get it right to your doorstep in these COVID times. And, you know, you can get it within a week of ordering it. And uh, I really just can't tell you enough. Go out there, support Heron Hill Winery. That's heronhill.com, and use code HS5 so that we know that um, you're going there from listening to us and you're going to uh, go a long way to helping out this podcast. Heron Hill Winery, the official wine of hunters, and more importantly, their wives and girlfriends everywhere. Trophy Ridge products are intelligently designed to give you a distinct advantage and be deadly accurate. The team at Trophy Ridge believes smart, hunt-inspired innovation should be at the foundation of each product's existence. You have enough to worry about on a hunt. Your gear should not be one of them. Trophy Ridge accessories give you the comfort of always knowing you're using the best bow hunting equipment when out in the woods or at the range. For information on the all-new 2021 lineup of Trophy Ridge sights, quivers, rests, releases, and stabilizers, visit TrophyRidge.com. Trophy Ridge, the tools bow hunters trust. Somewhere up high. So dark red blood can mean a muscle hit or liver or what's the difference between a liver blood and a, and if a heart blood? For instance, is there any difference that so you can notice? My experience is just, you know, the heart and lung blood is usually like kind of a pinkish, bright red. Yep. Um, liver hit, obviously, and obviously lungs, like we said, you have uh, bubbles in the blood. Um, and um, liver hits, usually that dark red. Um, and I haven't really had much experience tracking deer that were hitting like a muscle hit or anything like yeah. that but just from reading because <laughs> you're a good shot well no yeah. I, I just yeah. I, just i don't know how i've never hit one in the shoulder i just never have um you know now i'm jinx probably i'm probably gonna be hitting them there I mean, yeah. it's, it's so easy to hit it no deer you figured it out it was your sever broadheads right the way they were shooting with your <sighs> yeah we could talk about it. I, I spent the whole next day I mean, it was me, obviously. I, I mean, I, I thought at first I had... you thought you misjudged the distance, yeah. but... Yeah, that was a whole other thing with my... You know, I thought I misjudged the distance because my rangefinder wasn't working and because it was so cold. And when I stopped them, that deer, there was so much snow on the ground. Everything looked so different. And I know every rock and tree in that place. I know what the yardage is. And I just thought he was at 40. And I thought, oh, he must have been at 30, 35 when yeah. I hit. And that's why I hit him high and... But then the next next day or whenever it was, I went home and I shot my bow and it, the broadhead just kept hitting high right exactly three inches to the left and high exactly yep. where I hit him. So I'm assuming that's what it was. I don't know why that was the issue. I had sighted those in, you know, before the season and everything and thought they were shooting just like my field tips and something happened. It, it, my, my bow must have been off or something. I, I don't know. But um, So go back to the buck that, you know, that I did get. Like I said, I, I it was not dark red, so and I had bubbles, so I said, okay, I'm feeling good that this is probably a double lung, at least one lung. But again, in the tree stand, I'm not feeling good. I'm thinking the worst as you usually do, <laughs> and now I know a coyote's on his trail. I'm like, this is gonna be a nightmare. He's getting pushed by that coyote, or you yeah. Know. After the shot, it's like, yeah, if you can be a little more pessimistic, even though you won't always be optimistic, honey. But after the shot, if you're like, well. If you could tell yourself maybe it wasn't the best shot, it won't feel as bad if you don't end up finding them. Yeah. Right? I mean, but and it feels better almost when you get up to it and you're like, oh, yes, it was a perfect shot and he's dead. It's it's funny because it's, if it's your friend, like if you if you called me and told me, and I, like I think even you were telling me, oh, you got him, that's a dead Yeah, dead. yeah, I was that's being what, optimistic. That, well, everyone says that. You know, you always need that the friends, especially yeah. on the tracking job because uh, – 
you know, I'm right away. No, I don't think it's good. I'm telling my friend, no, I don't know. I think it's, it's high end back. I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I'm not feeling good. I'm not feeling good. Yeah. And then when I was showing the blood that, because what had actually had happened to go back to the uh, shot site where the arrow went through him, that was the only, the only blood that was there was where he, it went through the deer. And so I was looking up ahead where he ran and there was no blood, which yeah. happens a lot. You know, even with a pass through, it can happen where that first 20, 30 yards, they might not really be um, a ton of blood yeah. when they take off like a, a rocket, you know. That's why you got to do a circle if you can't find it, right? Yeah. And I, and I actually, I want to touch on that at the end. I'm going to touch on that because um, we actually backtracked the blood trail. And I, I want to touch on that just because, like you said, you have a lot of new people. And I learned a lesson myself, too, actually, a little bit. But um, so I wait, went back in my tree stand again. <laughs> I waited. And then finally, I don't. I honestly don't remember how long I waited. I probably a total from the shot time. I, I want to say it was maybe two hours, maybe, um, maybe longer. I can't even remember. Yeah, I remember because you were texting me. It was a long time. Yeah, it was quite a while. Uh, I figured at this point, if the if the if the if the coyote was gonna bump him out of his bed, he he's got he's already happened. It's not me getting down early is gonna help. The only thing me getting down early is gonna help is getting him off the deer if he's eating it, <laughs> which obviously is a huge concern. Yeah. So. My friend who was hunting, I said, listen, I'm going to get, I already got blood. I know I got blood. I said, I'm going to get down. I didn't want his hunt to be over. I said, I'm going to get down and I'm going to, if, if I'm going to walk a little ways, um, cause one of the mistakes that I made was that, you know, for a new hunter and I tell my friend, been telling my friends this all constantly is that please remember where the last spot is that you saw the deer. Oh yeah. Which in this case I did not, I did do that. I always, I'm good at doing that. What I didn't really pay attention to too much is right after I hit him, exactly the path he took across this bowl. Yeah. Like, he had to jump, go across a rock wall and everything. And, I mean, I know where he went. I could see him. But in the moment, he ended up actually running. When I backtracked the blood, he ended up running probably 10, and as he angled, 10, 20, 30 yards at least wider than I even thought he did. Mm -hmm. So what I did when I got down, I I didn't see any blood right away. So I said, all right, I'm not going to walk anywhere near where I think he went and mess up the blood trail. I'm going to walk straight through up to where I last saw him. Because I know that where I, right before where I last saw him is he cut left. So the blood trails, if there's a blood trail, it's going to be right there between the blowdown and the boulder. So I walked up and really quietly I got up there and I'm on the other side of the little hill and I can see blood. And I'm like, oh, yes, there's a trail, blood trail, thank God. So I got up there and I looked over to my left and there he was. He I was just right there. all I saw was his hind. What had happened is the the coyote had just picked. They always pick at the rear end for some reason. He didn't even break through the skin. He had just pulled the hair off of it and then left. I guess probably going to come back. <laughs> Coyotes love that butthole. For I don't know reason. what it is. They always <laughs> do that. My other fear was that he peed all over it because a lot of times they will pee, especially if there's a pack of them. They will pee all over it. Savages try to. And, and that happened to my 10-pointer, um, that one right there, uh, the half that half mount there. That They, yep. they did that. Not, I had to leave that one overnight, but they not only did they tear him up, but they peed all over him. <laughs> um, but this one, I looked and I saw because especially with the the, – the, because um, he was right around a corner. And all I saw was not the white belly, but I just saw his white – all the white hair where it had pulled up. Yeah. I was like – yep. I'm like, oh my god, you got to be kidding me! And I, I actually filmed walking up to him. Uh, I got caught some of that, so I can. I wonder why he didn't eat any of it. And he just I, I don't know. Picked at it. I don't know. He did not even break the skin or anything. He just pulled some hair off. Have you eaten any of that deer yet? Um, no, I haven't. I haven't. Maybe you should try it. Maybe it tastes weird. And yeah. Coyote was like, ah, <laughs> fuck that. He got a bad. <laughs> he got a bad smell of it. Yeah, maybe he knows something I don't. Um, but. Oh, actually, no, I did. I ate the back. I ate the tenderloins, and they were awesome. So yeah, right, I, did, yeah. I did eat the tenderloins. So he was good. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I, I whatever I I was not expecting him to see him there. You know. So obviously, you know the feeling, and I, I just the the shock, and I was shocked. You know, because I figured even if he was dead there, the coyote would have made some noise digging. Yeah. You know, pulling him around, and he would. I thought he was gonna start hollowing or something. You know, and nope, he must have just picked it a little bit and kept going. Very it's strange. also the exact opposite of like the the one the week before, you know, that you shouldered and went all over the place and didn't find it. Yeah. You know, just to have him be laying right oh. there and have it be easy. That's you know. It really was, especially after sitting in the tree stand for a few, you know, a couple hours, anyways, at least. Yep. You know, and well, it's a beautiful buck. Yeah, I mean, it was he was nice. He was a three and a half. He wasn't super heavy. He was wide. Um, you know, pretty much when I see a buck come in, I mean, now that I'm 
being a little more specific, I, I, you know, I will look at it a little bit more, but usually right away, I just quickly look at the rack body size. You know, if it's not a big rack, I look at the body and if I just think it's a mature deer, you know, boom, I don't ever look at the rack again. Yeah. Ever. I don't, I don't even know what I've shot ever almost. I don't think I've ever, other than maybe the, that big 10 point is the only one I've ever had a chance to really see. Do you, do for you even bring binoculars with you? You know, it's funny, I do, especially at this spot, and I didn't that morning. I forgot them. Yeah. Um, because a lot of times I can see across on the other side of the hill, the little bowl there, I can see deer go through. Um, yeah. So if yeah, it's far enough is. away, you'll put the binocs on it. But if it's coming at you... Usually you're... don't. Yeah. Yeah. Unless, you know, if I see one chasing, you know, or if it's going away from me and I'm not sure, like I see a flash in the antler, like that, the morning that I shot that 10-pointer a couple of years ago, I had seen the drop tine buck. I'm pretty sure it was him going into the bedding area before yep. this 10 pointer came in and i had picked up the binoculars and all i saw was like a high white rack just i knew it was a huge buck and you know i, I at that point i knew there was a big buck in there but i wouldn't be able to tell without the binoculars yeah but i mean it's it, it but oh just the thing i want to talk about with the tracking is so after you know my friend came over and everything i, I really wanted to track check the blood trail like when we got to the deer you know like i said he was right there where i walked up and there was bubbles and good blood trail but i said i want to see where did he go like well, and how fa- when did the blood actually start and i think that's a good thing maybe um to point out is that even if you see a deer fall I guess I guess if you have a lot of experience, you don't need to. But I think you can learn. No matter how many years of experience, you can always learn something. And uh, I think even if you see it fall, you should still check the blood trail. Learn Pretend from you, it. Yeah. yeah, learn from it. See what it looks like compared to other blood trails. You know, if you hit this one on double long, if you've never hit one before, you know, see what it looks like. The color. Yeah. How much there is. Um, you know, I, I so I tracked this one back, and this is that's when I realized. My friend, I kept saying, oh, it must have started right here. And, I, you know, at this point, I'm like 60 yards away. He's like, no, no, way over here. And he kept going far to the left, far to the left. I'm like, no, no, he didn't run that way. I'm like, he yeah. did not go that far over. And sure enough, he just, when he took off, he was way to my right. He went way to the right more than I realized. And so, you know, you, you do want to see, try and watch where they run initially and where you last see, seen them. I mean, I, I, we had seen them, and I think that's probably one of the most important things as far as trying to find your deer but in this case i didn't even watch the trail he ran i just know i just watched him run across the bowl but didn't mark anything yeah until he until i last saw him and i saw where he went and you know it was just again it was one of those situations where you know luckily i probably got the back lung well i know i got the back lungs back of the two lungs and well that i mean it kind of goes into so a couple couple nights ago i guess it was like probably five nights ago now um i shot at a buck that was great for me i don't know how exactly how big he would have been because i never found the arrow i didn't find any blood there was no snow to track but and i took a shot i probably shouldn't have you know i've i've been sitting a lot this year I've, I've seen almost 60 deer, I think, and like 16 bucks and some good ones. And just none of them have got into that, you know, perfect yeah, that window pocket. that I want. Because yeah. yeah, I'm not sitting in spots that I've been hunting for years and I've trimmed, you know, trimmed lanes out. I'm kind of hanging and hunting, you know, bringing my climber in. And, you know, it looks it looks kind of nice in the morning and the dark. And then you get up and there's like all these branches yep. and wispy shit everywhere. Yep, I ran into that this year. Yeah, and I, so I'm in this spot and... This buck was coming perfect the way I wanted him to, like the way I drew it up. Once it became daylight there, and I was like, "Oh, that this is this is where I want him to walk through, coming right out of that swamp." Actually, it was an afternoon hunt, so it looked that way when I got up there. I'm like, "All right, he's going to come out of the swamp here, and that's where he came out, and he's going to go right here into my 25 or my 35, perfect windows." And um, I had a scrape there, and I had sprayed some buck bomb in there and stuff, and um. He came in exactly where I wanted him to at, uh, I don't know, it was like 20 minutes before, um, uh, 20 minutes before legal and ending, legal light ending. And, uh, he just doesn't go into that spot. Of course he takes, he, he goes behind a tree that I had at 37 yards. He goes behind it and starts quartering away a little bit and then turns broadside again and he's just smelling the ground the whole time. He came in real slowly, kind of tilting his head sideways. And 
doing i haven't seen a deer a buck put his head sideways like that and was sniffing i think it was close to where i sprayed the buck bomb but it didn't get to it because i had that sure. in the 30 30 yard range um it was a beautiful buck he was long-legged he was tall and i, I just don't know how big he was so anyway, he's quartering away, and he's he's in what I'm guessing because it's behind that 37 is like a 40 yard range, and I'm looking, and I go, and it's hard to tell when it's when it's getting dark um, if there is an opening, and I ran into that last year yeah. too. There was there were some twigs and sticks and branches there, and um, but I was just my buddy the other day told me he's like you got to let one fly every once in a while, or you're never gonna know, and that kind of made me. I was like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot I'm gonna shoot at him if he gets behind that tree and as soon as his shoulder comes out and his vitals are open i'm gonna i'm gonna let one go and i did and he it was weird because he did tuck his tail a little bit it seemed like he got low to the ground and he just ran back into the shelter of the swamp so i thought maybe i was like oh maybe maybe i hit him i never ended up you know i sat in the stand until it got dark another buck actually came in and made a scrape at 20 yards yeah you told me that right at right at dark you know, he was right there making a scrape. I got down and looked, and he was actually rubbing a tree and scraping there. It was a fresh rub, um, and I could have shot that thing if I had, if I had not taken my arrow out and taken my release off, and oh, I could have, yeah. I could have had a good shot at him. Um, but it was right; it was two minutes before the end of legal light, and it was hard to see there anyway, even on, even at twenty yards. But ended up getting down, checking um, that arrow half hour later. Um, looking for the arrow, looking at the spot, but in the tree, I made sure I'm like, all right, remember that tree. Cause that's yeah. the one I, you know, that's what I arranged at. And that's the one that he stepped behind, but then it got dark and I got down there and the trees all look kind of similar. And I, I wasn't sure if I was at so the right hard. tree and I looked so hard, especially oh, in a man. thick area. Yep. I just never found an arrow. I never found anything, no sign of it. Uh, my buddy, Chris came back. I, I left, you know, left that night after searching for a half hour for the arrow and went back to my house and um chris met me there and he's he's like oh, I've, I've got this you know fluorescent you shine this this light and it'll pick up blood let's go out and look for it so we went back out and we looked for another 45 minutes or an hour just trying to find the arrow couldn't he found what we thought was a tiny speck of blood but i think it at, at the end of the day it was just wetness under the leaves and sure, some yeah, of the brown probably. brown leaf on it, on it but it looked in, in that in that light like blood but yeah didn't find it and i think that if i was filming i would have it would have been great because you know exactly where that buck was um and even if you think you're pointing at the right tree and you're remembering the tree you know it's really hard sometimes to remember where that buck was when you shot it at last light yeah i mean one thing i do and i did it um luminox man i gotta get i gotta yeah get luminox. i mean that helps um if the, the, the arrow doesn't stay in them that helps um one of the things I did with the, even though I, it was an open area, that I'll do sometimes, and I think I did it with the deer that I shouldered, is I'll take a picture from the tree stand. Now, at last light, it's not going to help you, but if it's oh, yeah. daylight, That's a good idea. I take a picture from the tree stand, or I'll take a little video. Um, obviously, when I have the camera and I'm filming, usually I can take video with that, but even just taking a picture with the camera and so that you can, because like you said, you get down. You walk over, you're like, it's, oh, it's only 30 yards over there. I'm going to be able to walk right up to that tree that I see. And then you get down, you're like, wait a minute, wait, which tree was it? Yeah, was, yeah. And, you know, if you can see in the picture that, oh, wait a minute, it's two trees over from this blowdown. Oh, it's this one. Yep. You know, um, so definitely that helps, taking a picture a or a video um, before you get down. But, like, in your situation, last light, you know, it's just And because last I didn't tough. find the arrow, I thought maybe it was in them, but... Yeah. Uh, I don't know, man. You would have heard. It, I think you would have heard the smack. And you st- I remember you telling me that you didn't think you heard. Yeah, that I kind of like blacked out after the shot. <laughs> yeah, and I don't that remember. Happens. I don't remember what you know what the sounds you know, or if it hit a branch or anything. It's so hard. I, you know, it it's so hard. I keep telling my friends like, you know, because I know I'm going to be the one helping them track. So I'm like, please remember that last spot. Remember where you hit them. You know, listen, listen. But in the heat of the moment, and your it is just so hard. Even yeah. after you know, I've been hunting for like almost thirty years, I think, and. It's just hard to, you get so pumped up sometimes. You might be able to calm down in the moment of the shot. Yeah. But once everything, once hell breaks loose and the deer takes off, you're just like, oh, what happened? What happened? Okay, where's he going? <laughs> Did I hit him good? <laughs> it happens so fast. It really does. Oh, yeah. And like the one I shot last Saturday, that's, you know, like I said, he was in on me. He was in on me. You know, it's funny too, because I had my bow hanging 
and it's in a spot that I can easily grab it. But I highly recommend, you know, these, you know, in November, most of the time, um, that you just have your bow in your hand. I know yeah. a lot, I know some guys never hang it up. I can't hold it all the time, especially when it's really, really cold. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I usually wear very thin gloves yep. and a hand muff and keep my hands in, you know, when it's really cold. This so is I can... the first year I've had the bow arms and I've enjoyed it because yeah. I have been holding on to it all the yeah, other years. I, I, think it's, I think it's a good tip to do that. I mean, I'm telling you, it's... If most... it's a quiet day, maybe hold it. But if it's crunchy and you can, you're going to hear them coming... Then yeah, they, exactly. Yeah. yeah. If it's windy or rainy or soft, yeah, you, you want... Because they can come in so fast. Like yep. like I said, even this buck that came in, I don't know if it's because he was trotting, but he wasn't breaking branches or anything. He was... I was like, is that a deer? Like, yeah, oh, yeah, that's something coming. And then I'm like, oh, that's a coyote. And the next thing I knew, there he was. He was it's a little like, bit light-footed, huh? Yeah. And a lot of times they just come... The bucks anyways, the mature ones, they come cruising through. Yeah. Well, they're chasing a doe through. I had that happen one time that this buck came in. Of course, it was a really windy day, and he was chasing this doe. He, They came in. It was, even though it was windy, you could still hear. I didn't hear. Next thing I knew, it was just, they were under me. And yeah. I could see almost 100 yards across. They came across it mm-hmm. so fast, and I could never get a shot on the buck. But even if he came under my stand, I didn't have my bow in my hand. Yeah. You know, so, I don't know. It's tough. It's, like you said, you can... Um, you know, it's tough, especially at night, like you were saying. It's it's tough to see sometimes where you are and where you hit them and where they went and all that, and it's tough. Um, so let's do one thing real quick, because this guy commented on um, one of our listeners on a YouTube page that some of the terms that you and I might throw around are people who have been hunting for a long time. We know them, but, uh, you know, it's they got to learn the terms. So he, I think he commented that somebody mentioned a bench and he had to look up what that meant. But I wrote down a few things that we talked about that maybe – a new hunter won't know what it is. Let's just go through them real quick and and uh, and define them. So blowdowns. Oh, so yeah, blowdown. It, it's basically if you have a pile of trees, a tree that fell down, or yeah. I call any pile of a very concentrated bunch of branches or or, yeah. or, or limbs or whatever. But essentially, it's just a tree down. that's been knocked yeah. down or blown down or whatever. Yeah. Yep. So blow. That's what a blowdown. Funny. Is. You don't think about that. You people don't, think don't of, know that. Right. <laughs> just right. Been saying it for years. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, so a bowl. What is the land feature when you when you talk about a bowl and the land feature? So seems pretty. I mean, look at your look at a bowl, and that's exactly what it is. Like the ridge is all yeah, concentrated exactly. at the bottom, and there's a there's a low area, and it Fun, they all funnel down into a little lower yep. area, pretty much. Yep. So I, if you can find a bowl, it's a good spot to sit a lot of times because it's a natural funnel for deer yeah i mean it's funny because this spot that i've been hunting years i just put a stand in there and we call it the bull just so i could see deer never thinking that they'd be funneling right past me all the time yeah Um, but then you learn they did yeah you learn i mean yeah um and then tell me what an orbital orbital gland is and um getting the scent from an orbital gland on a buck so uh, again i don't have a ton of experience with that but uh so basically i think and i think i want to say that's where um you know, like I said, Chad there that we were talking about, Chad Whitcomb, I believe is his name. Yep. Uh, backdoor sense. Yes, back yep. backyard backyard sense. sense. Backyard sense out in um, I think he's out in Charlton. <laughs> backdoor scent might be something else. I don't <laughs> think you want to want to be hunting. But with I think that. some of his glands that where they run, they rub their you know orbital glands up uh, on the the yeah, licking branch. Just the the it's right around their eye. Right, right around yep. their eye, and it's and and from what I've read and anything that I've heard, you know, that that's the real and the most important for sure scent and and um and that's really that's the, how they the, identify each other exactly there. Yep. i was gonna say their id scent yep. um you know you'll see and i've seen it you've probably already seen it on your cameras that deer don't even come over and pee in the scrape they just rub their overall glands right yep, on the, sometimes on the branch and um and uh they don't even pee and, yep. and, and you know and even so the urine you know I, I know that i think someone talked about it on your pa- podcast about Peeing, you know, everybody's always, oh, you can pee in your, pee in your scrape. To yeah, snap, everybody but, thinks different. Yeah, but uh, you know, as pee just turns, urine just turns into, you know, ammonia, and yeah, I think what, they all smells pretty much similar. What to John deer. Petrick was saying about that because he doesn't pee out of his stand; he pees into a bottle that he brings with him, and then he uses yeah. it as a hand warmer sometimes. <laughs> it's like you can make your own hand warmer by peeing into a bottle. But he says, like, yeah, I'm sure it turns into ammonia and it just smells the same, but if you're all like deer aren't constantly peeing in the same exact spot. So if you're sitting in a stand a lot and you're always peeing out of it, 
then it just smells like an ammonia bath. And because it's right. too much there, that might trigger them, right? To be like, eh, there's something weird about this spot always I, smelling a lot like piss or the base of your tree. I kind of, uh, yeah, and I kind of agree with some of the other guys. I don't know if um, who's mentioned it on there before, but some of the guys that go along the line of they just don't want the deer to know them, so they don't use any scents. Yeah. Um, I definitely think scents can help. I know for you, you know, I've used the Buck Bomb spray um, for quite a bit. I've, I've been putting it on my boots, and I've had deer yeah. like a lot coming in on my boot track in the morning. Yeah, that this so year. when we were talking that video that I was telling you about um, that buck that I shot over where you're hunting now. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I say it in the video, but that I had buck ball on my boots, and that deer, that buck followed my my um, yeah my my boot prints right up to where I shot him. Yep. Um, and I think it helps, but like that goes back to what we were just saying about peeing yourself. I just I totally agree with if you, I don't think it's always going to kill you, but any scent out, and if it's a lot, like if you pee, how long, you know, when you pee, that means you really have to pee and you're going to pee a gallon out there. Yeah. (laughs) And it's probably going to be very concentrated and very strong. And do you really want, you know, you might not want a deer to be totally alerted. Even if it's not scaring him, he's just like, whoa, he's on alert now. He just, he's got smell. And, you know, I think any scents can hurt you that way where you're putting them on full alert. You've got their attention now they're smelling, and then if your scent is not good, boom, they they get your scent. And Dude, you know gone. that spot that we're talking about where I'm hunting now, and <laughs> you ended up you hunted there years ago, on almost the same spot. I I smelled like Thai food the other day in there. I was just must have been right. <laughs> I must have been like right in the perfect like spot where somebody hanging. somebody and the houses are thousand yards away or something but the wind somebody had thai food and i could smell that i was like That's damn funny. i wondered so so the bucks in there probably do smell yeah. food all the time stuff you know yeah and and again you know people talk about the scent all the time where oh they're used to people they're used to people they're used to people, but they, they still know, avoid you. They know when okay, that person's twenty yards away. Like that's they're yeah. not, they they're like okay, that's not the normal, you know, strong. I mean, that's not the normal weak smell that I'm getting when they're in their backyards. Yeah, they're right here somewhere, and you know, that's I totally believe in that. Like, yeah, I, I don't believe in they might be a little bit less on guard or fearful if they're not getting hunted a lot. Yeah. But I don't believe that, oh, they're used to people and that they smell you in your stand. They're going to be like, ah, eh. yeah, I smell that all the time. It's like, no, they're, you're out in the middle of the woods. Unless you're right behind someone's backyard, which I do know some people, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people do hunt that way in suburbia. But if you're out in the woods, they know, okay, that's not normally that strong here. So yep. that's how I feel. This, this particular place is near a walking trail too. So yep, that helps. there's lots of scent going in and out of there. Yeah. I mean, I just, but still. And even if they're used to it, they're still always going to be on guard. Yeah. Like, you know, so if they come in and they smell you and your stand and they're used to smelling people walk or they even watch people walk by, mm-hmm. you've still put the, they're still on alert. So now they're looking, now they might circle a little more. They might be more attentive and they see you up in the tree because now they're paying, you know, and it's like game over. Yeah. All right. Let's go through two more of these and then we'll do um, a quick rut report and talk about like the type of rutting action we're seeing right now. And people are going to hear this four or five days later, but... So it might change, but um, two more shouldered. When you shoulder a deer, you just it means you you hit them in the shoulder with your arrow, and the arrow is kind of sticking out of it. You know, it's they've got a hard shoulder bone there, and most of the time you don't get a pass through the arrow. They run away with the arrow stuck in them. Right? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of guys are shooting heavy arrows and stuff. You can put it, you know, depending on fixed broadheads or even supposedly these severed broadheads, you can put it right through the shoulder onto the other side, but. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, when I say a shoulder to a deer, like that one, this missed the does, vitals and missed the vitals. And it doesn't look like there was a lot of penetration. I yeah. don't know if it, you know, it doesn't look like it went through. Yep. And then luminox. So what are luminox? So, um, lighted knocks. So I guess, you know, luminox, a brand. Yeah. Um, I don't even know what they have for brands now. There's been so many different ones. Um, it's kind of like but, the, the Frisbee where, the Frisbee was the first brand to come out with that thing, and yeah. then there are a million of them, yeah, but everybody, everybody refers to it as the Frisbee. Yeah. yeah. The Luminox is that for... Um, I don't even think I even... Ha- the ones I have are even Luminox anymore, but... Right. But yeah, the Lighted Knox, which... Uh, the the reason I like l- Lighted Knox is, especially like you would your situation the other night where it's yeah. low light, yep. is um, just being able to... It, it helps you. It can help you. Maybe not all the time, but it can really tell you where you hit that deer. Um, and just as an example, 
uh, that buck right there. Yep. When he came in on me, I heard him coming. And he came down, and I got into my stand late. I had just got into my stand. And when he came down, he was at about 15 yards, and it was it was dark. I could see his – I knew there was a huge rack on his head, and I grunt stopped him. I was at full draw, and I could – I luckily, it was enough light that I could go up his leg, and just I just went back behind his shoulder a little bit. It's hard yep. to see the shoulder, but I just went up his front leg and went back a little bit. And when I hit – when I shot – I could see where the Luminoc went in. Yeah, it's like a it tracer helped. round. Exactly. You know, it's... And, and and I could tell that, oh, I got, just made a good shot. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It went in um, right it, behind the shoulder. It lights up when? Right when it releases or when it impacts? It As soon as it – so when you draw back and you release, the pressure of the arrow string just yeah. turns that – at least that's how most of them work. Right. Um, so the whole flight, you can see the see the yeah, you can see the loom not go. Th- you can see it go through the air, um, especially in a long shot, and you can see, you know, if the deer runs off, you can see it running off with it in it. Yep. You can see if he throws the arrow halfway out, you know, that helps. Um, again, a big thing is being able to see. Oh, that did not that I hit him far back. Yeah. You, you know, like in low light, it's hard to see. Like, you know, as you know, you shoot at low light and. Even if you're on a deer, it doesn't mean that's where you're going to hit them. And so I, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of guys where they're like, oh, I was right on his shoulder. I got a great shot. And then they get back and it's like guts. They hit guts. Mm-hmm. And they're like, whoa. I think I even did that once. Um, and, it, you know, when you didn't have a light of knocks and you realize, oh, I hit way far back. If you had a light of knock on, you're pretty much probably going to see where that thing buries in them. Yeah. So. Yep. All right. So we'll talk about quickly, um, you know, what's, what we're seeing in the woods and uh, – it's funny because I've got a lot of cameras on. I checked a bunch of cameras, and I have chasing on cameras as early as um, October 24th, but I didn't really thought about it that, like you said, you said, I bet you they're small bucks, right? And they are. They are, they were like little five and six pointers that were pushing does on the 24th, and those are the ground scattering them in, the, in this particular spot. Um, but, you know, that, that's still, you know, it gives, gives you reason to be out on the woods on October 24th. You, you see, and it was three or four days straight of those guys pushing does in there. Yeah. But um, this this past Monday, so actually it was, uh, I think, Friday or Saturday when I shot at that buck at 40 yards, couldn't find the arrow, and you told me, well, what was he doing? Was he walk? Did he just walk out of the swamp, or was he chasing does? And he was just kind of slowly walking out of the swamp, and you, you're like, all right, so the, the rut hasn't started yet for the big guys. You know, they're, they're, they're not chasing yet. Um, so I thought it was interesting you said that because then the very next day I can hunt on Monday. Monday morning was pretty nice day. It was pretty cool in the morning, and um, I get in. I, I sprayed my boots with uh, um, buck bomb, and at ten minutes before daylight, there a, a deer was coming in, but it's right on my boot track, and it stuck around. So when daylight came around, I saw that it was a doe, um, but she slowly just kind of meandered off, and I wasn't going to shoot her anyway. Then ten minutes later. A doe and a fawn came in down the hill from front of me, and I was going to shoot this one. She was a big doe, and her fawn looked pretty well grown up, and, you know, I I just put it in my mind. I need to get something in the freezer. She was nice. She was coming in right at 20 yards. I put my phone, I have my little (laughs) phone mount, and I I turned it towards her, and um, she stops and looks at me. She picked me off, I think, right as I turned my phone, and... Uh, so I might not have got a shot off her any, on her anyway, but my phone slowly just like falls out of that thing, hits the ground, and they took off. And I was like, Jesus, man, this. And so now I got to climb down to get my phone because it was still it was still recording. Batteries. That was drain by the way. It. That was like the greatest footage I've ever seen. It was pretty funny because <laughs> you even told me that you had said that your phone had fell, and I wasn't really sure what you meant. Yeah. And when I was watching the video, it's like. I'm, and I'm in anticipation. Even though I know you didn't shoot the doe, I'm like, oh, yeah. she's right there. And all of a sudden, yeah. the phone just goes yeah. crash into the I'm, you... I'm going to put that thing into like a recap when I, oh after my I get God. my first first Very buck funny. this year. Funny for, you, funny for me, not for you. And she, So she ran away, and I'm sitting there thinking, Jesus, man, this isn't going to be a good day because it's, it's not going my way. They just spooked off. I got to climb down, get my phone. I'm making all this noise. But it was still only like 15 minutes after illegal shooting light at that point. And... Um, you know what? I started thinking, and I even said in one of my videos, um, I was like, well, maybe now I know I got bait. I got three does in here. And that's the mm-hmm. first time in a few days that I've been sitting. And, like, the last few times I sat there, all I saw were bucks. And I didn't get any opportunities. And there was way more bucks on my cameras than does in there, too. So I was just like, I wonder where the does are. This morning they were coming in, and they sprinted away up the hill. 
and I was thinking to myself when I said it, I'm like, yeah, I got some, I got, I got bait out there now. And, um, it wasn't 10 minutes after that, again, that they sprinted up. My phone fell down. I climbed down, climbed, picked up my phone, got, got back up in the tree. And, uh, I, I was, I took my whole mount off. I'm like, I'm not freaking having that thing again. Cause if a buck comes through and my phone falls out, oh. I would be so pissed. So I, <laughs> I, I put my mount away and put my phone in my pocket. Otherwise I would have had this great footage 10 minutes later. This is the first time I've ever seen this in the woods, man. Um, it was awesome chasing. Those those does came down the hill so fast, like a bat out of hell. They were doing. They did a big circle, and there was a buck, a good buck behind them, nose to the ground. And I hear him. I hear him grunting, and the grunts just don't sound like. Actually, every time I hear on anyone's videos too, a buck chasing grunt sounds like nothing like any of the calls that. No. Any of the grunt tubes. It's like a low, like very, it's very like very like low and it's usually very short too when they yeah. when they're tending or chasing it's like, Yeah. Meh. And like it just doesn't sound like anything. So anyway, he's he pushes pushes those does around, they take off again. Five minutes out and they're this is like sixty five yards out or something. Five minutes later, either that same buck or a different buck. I didn't have binoculars on because my vortex is broke, but um Vortex actually has a great warranty thing and they're gonna I gotta send it back. They're gonna fix it for free. So I had no binocs, and uh, another buck came down, or it could have been the same one right on their trail, but there were no does this time. Just sniffing it, and he was trotting around. So I was like, "Man, this activity came out of nowhere." Another ten minutes after that, they came back down again, sprinting those does. Well, it was actually one doe first, then it was a big eight, and he's one of my two big ones in there. And I put up, I used my um, rangefinder to as a kind of a makeshift binocular as yeah. he was going through. And I could <clears> tell, I knew exactly what buck it was, and it was a big one. And he was right on her. I tried to stop him. They were still 45, 50 yards out, and I have no shot. I, I would have had to get them to come in. But he had, he wanted nothing. He didn't care. He was on that doe. And then the smaller doe, I think the fawn, was kind of like trailing the buck, just c- trying to keep up with mom. Oh, he, yeah. He, he didn't give a shit about her, but <laughs> the, fawn, the fawn was like running along with him. Anyway, I, I that was awesome. It was the first time I've seen that kind of chasing activity. And then I, I didn't get any shots that day. I went back for lunch. I came back out that night, and um, I had some chasing again. And it was two two does and a buck. And I'm not sure if it was the same one and the same two does. And he's been pushing her all day. But they came out. They popped out of the swamp real quick and then popped back in. I mean, I saw him for seven seconds or something. Yeah, that, I mean, and no shot. That's I've had such, some experiences like that with better than shooting a deer. Some deer I've shot. Yeah, like, it was that's a lot of fun. really cool to to watch. And it's tough sometimes too when they're doing that that you can't even get the buck to stop. I I think I have it on video too. I had a buck one time and I screamed at him. Yeah. You know, I first was grunting, rah, 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 and I was like, hey, 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 and I screamed yeah. like really loud. Never even stopped yep. for a second. They just so. I think a lot of times when you see the mature box chasing, that doe is ready. She's either already in heat or ready to go in heat. You know, they don't. Nothing's going to get them off. Her. I don't think they spend too much time chasing them around, you know, when she's not ready. I mean, yeah, they do. But I don't think, you know, like. like the said, younger guys the do. Young, yeah, because they don't know yet. They smell something going on and they're not, they don't realize she's not ready yet. So they, you know, they're, that's why I was saying when you saw it the other day, I was like, you know, it's probably going to be young bucks that early. But again, every area is different. Yeah. You know, I haven't seen any. Um, I haven't seen any. I saw two days ago in the morning, I saw a little buck chasing a doe. I filmed that. Um, it was really cool. I got footage from that. Is <clears throat> He chased her a little bit and then was gone on his own, you know, because he doesn't know what he's doing. He was probably like a little four. I think he was a little three or four pointer I have on camera. And then she, I think it was the same doe. I had never seen this before, and I filmed it. Um, she came in to where I was bleeding the entire time, nonstop. No, I think I've heard that. Where that's was some... she bleeding from? Ble- bleeding. <laughs> <Just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's bleeding. No, I didn't yeah. shoot her. Yeah. Uh, she came straight towards me from where I'd last seen them, and, and she just kept bleeding. Meh. Meh, meh, just bleeding, 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 nonstop. Kind of quiet, but you could hear it. Yeah. I think I have it on film. Um, I have to watch the footage, but nonstop, every step. She did it the whole way, mm-hmm. you know. And I think I've, I think I've heard that, that sometimes that means it could be in heat. I don't think she's in heat, um, just because there's a bunch of bucks in this area, and the only one that was in heat. I think this was the same doe. I'm, I'm guessing, but the only one was that little buck, and he didn't even stay with her. So 
Um, and I don't, I still have bucks, pitches of bucks over there hitting a scrape, including one when I was walking in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we won't talk yeah. about that. Um, so I, I haven't seen a lot of, um, mature buck chasing, but I haven't seen any. Um, but I haven't even really caught it on cameras yet. Yep. Uh, not in the areas that I've been in. I'm assuming it's probably happening this week and some of my areas into next, next week is, is going to be the week I'm every day going to be out. I think next week you'll yeah, be seeing gonna, a lot of mature box on yep. their feet. I was going to say, like, people are going to listen to this on Sunday. So this whole week after, you know, this whole week that you're listening to this, if you can sit all day, sit all day. Yeah. If you got the time, <clears> you can do it. Um, just because from all the other stuff I'm seeing on social media and some of the guys I'm talking to, they are seeing bucks at noon um, and yeah. getting them on their cameras at noon, big ones. I saw Jake Bennett just posted a um a video he got a nice old really old buck and he thinks he's eight and a half years old um and he was out in daylight um also it's been so dry that that buck was hitting water and um he had there's a little mm. you know vernal pool in front of him or something a little oversized puddle i think he calls it a pond in, in the video but um they are looking for water so if you got a spot that's got some water nearby yeah i mean you it, know. it just depends on your area every area is different and yep. I think a lot of the, the the big bucks, if you're getting close to where they're bedding, like, I, I mean, I don't know, like, where he shot that buck, but I'm guessing that that buck probably didn't go very far to get to that water. I, I just think up until maybe this week and next week, until the does are really in heat, they're just not traveling that, you know, much at all. They're not conserve even traveling. Conserve energy. Yeah, exactly. They, they, you know, you read about that all the time. They like, conserve, conserve, conserve. And then the older deer that know what they're doing, as soon as those does are in heat, they're all over them and then boom yeah. they're on to the next town or next neighborhood or yeah. whatever until they can find another hot doe so they're just waiting but so it should be an exciting week i think next week is going to be incredible yeah um, i think it's going to get a little bit colder it's too getting again. colder we've had all this warm weather um i always that week is always my favorite time to hunt anywhere between like the 13th the 14th and like the 21st yeah for, from to see mature box anyways maybe not necessarily get a buck down but to see mature box I feel like that's when I see most most of them is yeah. is that that time. So I think it should be good. We should be yep. seeing a lot of deer. We should deer get some down next week. And you and I are both going to Vermont this weekend for yep. a rifle opener, going to different camps. And yep. should be fun. That should time. be fun. Yep, excited. And, uh, we'll report back. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some some deer down next week. Yeah, hopefully. So, all right. Thanks again, Kevin. Sure. Appreciate it. Fun again. Yeah. Good time. Thanks for having me over. Thanks for listening to the Hunt Suburbia podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. We're going to release an episode every single Sunday throughout the season, throughout the entire year, and we will possibly be releasing some bonus episodes here and there um, throughout the week as people you know, come in freshly off a boat kill and tell their stories. We hope that happens throughout the season. Um, there might be weeks where you get two or three bonus episodes. You might not get one for a couple of weeks, but there will be some bonus episodes, but you can count on us every single Sunday to have uh, a new interview on throughout the season. Uh, once again, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week. Big bucks I've been dreaming often Every night till I'm in a coffin From my woods to the burbs of Boston I'm looking for a tree to get lost in Chris Warner's little dust in the snow Quality time, just me and my bow Fall evenings, I know just where to go For some quality times for me and my bow It's just me and my bow